there. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to go ahead and kick off because it is noon and we want to welcome everybody to We Spire Live, the second installment of our monthly show where we speak to some of the most fascinating people on this planet doing incredible work in ESG, DNI, well being, and social impact to really figure out the trend on this front and what can we be doing better as leaders and practitioners to ensure that our organizations are really preparing themselves for the challenges and opportunities of the next 10 to 20 years. Um, I'm super pleased to be joined today by Khalil Smith, who is the VP of Inclusion, Diversity, and Engagement for Akamai Technologies. And one of my favorite things to do when people join is to just hear their stories. How did you end up in this role? Because I can tell you 20 years ago, you and I both know there were no roles called VP of Inclusion, Diversity, and Engagement. Precisely. So tell me your story. Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief because I know we've got a lot of good stuff to get into. But I think in a lot of ways, my story, you know, it's like, oh, my story begins back with my parents. And it does, but I'll, I'll breeze through that part. But, um, you know, I was born and, and raised till I was about seven in New York um, with my parents who both, you know, grew up in New York City and I had an older brother who's two years older than I was. And when I was about seven, we moved to Connecticut. Uh, my father had always worked for IBM and wanted to get us out of the city. And so we moved to West Haven, Connecticut which is at right outside of New Haven. Um, and I, I, I raised that in part because, you know, we moved around a little bit when I was younger. When I was 17, we moved to New Jersey. Um, and I was this junior in high school that was trying to figure out how does it all fit together? I had my driver's license, but still had to take driver's ed. Um, I met my, the, you know, girlfriend at the time and future wife and current wife uh, in high school. Um, but a lot of it was just bouncing around and meeting people and connecting with folks and, um, you know, that was a large part of kind of my upbringing um, and, and I think laid the foundation for a lot of the work that I do now. Um, from a work perspective, the vast majority of my career was spent at Apple. So I worked at Apple from 2002 to 2016. The first seven years of that was in the retail stores. So I ran some of the flagship size stores like in Tyson's Corner, Virginia and Soho, New York. Um, and then had the fortune through some amazing sponsors and mentors and partners to move over to the training and development side of the business for Apple Retail. And so worked with a team and we were responsible for about 60,000 retail employees and all of the elements that go into ensuring that, you know, customers and visitors had an incredible, you know, visit when they came to an Apple store. Um, and also making sure that all of our employees had all of the feedback and the skills and the, the understanding of our culture and technical aptitude and really kind of, you know, finding people who knew the technology and maybe needed to learn a little bit more of the people skills um, or knew the people skills and needed to learn a little bit more of the technology. But in a lot of ways, inclusion and diversity and employee engagement were woven through all of that experience because we were opening stores all over the world. And we were trying to figure out how much Apple do you put in Shanghai and how much Shanghai do you put in Apple? How do you ensure that there's a level of consistency so that an employee could go from, you know, Bondi in, in Australia to, you know, one of our stores in Toronto, Canada, and still have an incredible experience and feel really rewarded and feel like they, they felt that thread of Apple no matter where they went. And yet there was local nuance and local flavor and a respect for kind of the, the cultural differences and personal idiosyncrasies that make us who we are. Um, and after 14 years, loved the company, loved what we were doing and decided, all right, the time is right for me to move on. On. I think I want to try consulting for a while. I've always been interested in it, but you know, haven't had to, had the fortune of testing those things out. Um, and so decided to kind of save up enough that I knew that my family and I wouldn't have to eat ramen noodles for a year, or you know, kind of sublet our our home. Um, and tried my my hand at consulting, and so worked with a number of organizations in the North Carolina area, which is where I am and where I was then, um, just to better understand 
how does psychology fit into business? How do you help organizations really embed things like feedback and coaching and performance management? Um, and I realized a lot of things. One was that I love to continue to do that work and I love doing it in a manner where I could share with others and write and speak. Um, whereas at Apple, because it's more of an insular company or a secretive company, a lot of the great work that we did was kind of within this, this ecosystem. Um, so I love that work, love the opportunity needed to be able to get out, but didn't love working by myself. I absolutely adore being with the team and having people yeah. that challenge my ideas and having people that I can push and, and, and you know, kind of work with. Um, and so had the option to either through some amazing relationships and partnerships, again, um, take a role at McKinsey, the famed, amazing consulting, you know, firm, um, or this small startup named uh, Neuro Leadership Institute. And, you know, for me, I've said a number of times that at that moment in my career, McKinsey was kind of the apple of consulting, right? Really well known, um, a bit predictable, obviously an incredible place to be, but your path is a bit more defined versus this Neuro Leadership Institute where we said, hey, we've got this great intellectual property. We think we've got a wonderful opportunity, um, but we don't, we need your support in kind of building it out. And so we do want you to write and speak and go talk to clients and build products and dig into the research and work with our partners. And that was just incredibly exciting and interesting to me. Um, and so did that for three years. And as a part of that, had the opportunity to meet Anthony Williams, who at the time was in a very similar role to the role that I have at Akamai um, and has since been promoted to the chief HR officer at Akamai. Um, but we met and connected and uh, Neuro Leadership Institute and Akamai started doing work together. And as a part of that, just really stayed close to the work that Akamai was doing and always respected the organization, respected the commitment to diversity and inclusion and employees and science and math and, you know, the real commitment to doing good in the world. Um, and so when the opportunity presented itself and Anthony said, hey, we're looking for someone to lead this work and I'd love for you to help us both kind of shape it and define it. And then ultimately he also gave me the option to apply for it. And so I raised my hand and That's I have amazing. not looked back since. That's awesome. Tell everybody what neuroleadership is. That's It's a concept I bet a lot of folks aren't familiar with, and it's really powerful. And obviously, given the work WeSpire does with behavior change and, and behavioral science near and dear to our hearts, but um, tell us about it. Yeah, so neuroleadership uh, is a, a, a phrase that was coined by Dr. David Rock, who is the founder and CEO, one of the co-founders, he and his wife co-founded the Neuroleadership Institute. And it essentially is, you know, kind of sitting at the intersection of understanding the neuroscience and social psychology and behavioral economics. So all the elements of why do we do what we do? What is going on in our minds? What is some of the kind of evolutionary predispositions, if you will, that say, hey, for so long, we've been working against the way that we have evolved or the way that we naturally are oriented. But if we can understand the research, amazing research being done, putting people into a functional MRI to see where does the blood go in our brains or putting us in situations and understanding how we tend to react, if we can understand that and then apply that to really practical, but largely kind of intractable challenges, right? So when we think about feedback, We've just said over and over and over again, well, we just need to get better at giving feedback. And yet when you, you know, strap people up to a machine and kind of read our, our you know, kind of um, uh, our heart rate or our uh, degree of perspiration, you recognize that receiving unsolicited feedback is incredibly threatening. And so if you can recognize that through the research, but we also know that we want to be good at feedback, you kind of start to flip the, the, the lens and you say, well, what if we got better at asking for feedback? because that lowers the temperature for both the giver and the receiver and lowers the temperature both literally and, you know, kind of metaphorically. Um, and so just examples like that of, you know, um, growth mindset at Microsoft or mitigating bias at BlackRock, kind of taking these really tangly challenges and applying them in a business context through the lens of things like neuroscience and behavioral economics. I love it. It's such great work and so powerful and so interesting to have practiced it as a consultant and then to bring it into a workplace. So let's talk about Akamai. I am convinced it is the product 
everyone uses without realizing it. Is that fair to, to that say? Is absolutely fair. Yes. If Akamai <laughs> disappeared tomorrow, not only would I be incredibly sad, but I think a lot of folks would be. Um, so Akamai is, you know, essentially in a lot of ways, the back end of the internet. So if you rewind the clock 25 years, um, our CEO and one of co one of the co-founders, um, Dr. Tom Layton, um, was a professor at MIT um, in Boston. And uh, he, and one of his grad students, um, uh, Danny Lewin, stood up Akamai in order to help solve the worldwide wait. So this notion that the internet was starting to come on board, and yet getting information from place to place was really challenging, and getting it that final few feet to our computers to be able to stream video and download content and you know transfer large amounts of information. Um, and so on any given day, we are moving a pretty significant portion of traffic across the internet. Um, and over the years, we've also stood up a really significant and robust security um, uh, kind of offering and group, um, and then have just recently made some incredible acquisitions to help stand up some of our compute as well. So delivery, security, and compute are really the three legs of our stool and allow us to power and protect life online, which is part of the mission of our organization. So here's a funny small world historic historical moment between the two of us, which is that um, early in my career, uh, the New York Times Digital was one of Akamai's very first customers. And I was the person in the meeting with Danny and Tom as they were trying to convince us. Um, and then we ended up using it because we were facing all these issues with photo delivery and content and things like that. And I um, mean, it was incredible. And uh, and obviously, um, Danny's death was incredibly uh, tragic and untimely in 9-11. In um, but interestingly enough, Bill Weil, who is a huge voice in ESG and sustainability as the former green energy czar for Google, head of sustainability for Facebook, was the CTO that took over after Danny. Isn't that, a, and then ended up being on WeSpire's board. Isn't that a funny, like small world connection between it our two companies? It absolutely is. I mean, all of these things fit together. And, you know, when you think about all of these kind of small um, moments, right? Like looking back, they seem so big. And yet in the moment, it's all of these kind of, you know, individual meetings to say, hey, we're trying to do this thing that's never been done before, or we have this problem that's never been solved before. And I think, you know, it, in a lot of ways, you don't recognize those moments when you're in them. And yet we reflect back, you know, constantly thinking about our history. And, you know, when we think about all of the, the challenges of the pandemic, it's one of the reasons I'm so, I'm so proud to work at Akamai, because I would argue that the internet has become um, kind of our newest utility, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not to take anything away, obviously, from clean water and electricity. Those are incredibly important. And yet when we think about the, the, the safety that many of us were able to afford by comfortably banking from home and having a confidence that we could put our information out there and that it wouldn't be intercepted um, or that we could, you know, get a, a video chat with our doctor and not have to go into an office. These are all things that would have been unthinkable 15, 20, 30 years ago and yet made us um, largely, and obviously lots of people still needed to go out, lots of people needed to take care of other things, but allowed many people to work safely from home or to get things done safely from home. Um, and similarly, you know, when the electricity goes out at my home, the first thing I'm concerned about is the Wi-Fi. I'm like, I, I know they'll get the, the electricity back on. I know I'll be okay. But what about how my much phone? battery do I have? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Like what, you know, how long do I have? You know, how do I get on yeah. my phone? How do I make things happen? And so, um, you know, Akamai absolutely sits at a very unique space in the world right now um, and is doing things that I think are incredibly powerful and useful and to, to, to do that while also focusing on our employees and doing all of that through the lens of our employees. You know, I mentioned our mission of to power and protect life online, our purpose, and we've actually spent a lot of time articulating that and really getting clear about it, is to make life better for billions of people billions of times a day. The scale at which we operate, the number of transactions that people, you know, go through. Um, Mind-boggling. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, Dr. 
Dr. Tom Layton has been with us for you know, since the beginning, looks at some of those, you know, those that 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 track record of like, well, we were moving this much data here, and now we're moving this much data. Oh my gosh, it's just it's multiple. You know, wouldn't you love to see the first investment pitch? They, that they have? I hope that's archived somewhere. In the I'm Oscar sure it is. Floor. I'll have to ask him to break it out. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that, uh, since most people aren't familiar with Akamai, they also probably don't realize how um, many employees you have and how global you are. So paint a picture for folks of what your workforce looks like. And then tell us a little bit about this transition that sort of happened as a result of the, the pandemic probably catalyzing other trends faster by being a tech company that is so... Um, global that is so disparate and that is so critical. Yeah, so we we have close to ten thousand employees across the world. We have a handful of um, you know what you could argue are kind of centers of excellence. So Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, Krakow, Poland, Costa Rica, um, uh, Bangalore, India, and then a number of offices in other places across the world. Um, so our ten thousand employees are spread all over the world. And um, to your point about kind of the the multiplying effect of the pandemic, um, we as an organization did a lot of research very early into the pandemic, and I take zero credit for it because 95% of it started before I got here. Um, but Anthony Williams and, and our, our entire kind of C-suite recognized that things were not going to go back to being what they had been previously, and so started to understand and work with some external vendors and our internal teams to understand what is our culture currently, what do we think it's going to need to be in order to continue to be successful as we navigate all of this, what are the things that we need to kind of hold steady and then where are the places that we either can be or need to be incredibly flexible to hold on to the culture and the successes and the ethos that we have and yet pivot given all of the change and all of the kind of ambiguity that we're experiencing right now. Um, and so we were very fortunate and have continued to enjoy an incredibly strong culture led by our leaders. Um, but we, we pivoted into well over 95% of our employees working remotely essentially through the entire pandemic um, and have made the decision, you know, unapologetically that we will continue to allow people well over 95% to work remotely at their, at, you know, kind of at their discretion. So we have a handful of really key roles that, you know, either have a, a certain level of security or a certain, you know, kind of role where they need to be in physical proximity of a particular station or um, they're cleaning our offices or an office manager type role. Role, um, which are incredibly important to getting things done in our beautiful spaces around the world. Um, and we have people that will go back into the offices one, two, three, four, five days a week. Um, but to have that flexibility and that trust really embedded in what we do, we refer to it as flex base. And it's our global flexible workplace program, um, which is you're either at flex or at office. Um, but knowing that we trust our people, knowing that we believe this is the right way forward, at flex is the norm for the vast majority of our teams. And trust is such a, a key word. You were involved in these conversations. How much of that trust was already baked in, in your mind to the operating principles and the operating processes? And how much of that trust has been a leap of faith, um, to, you know, uh, towards folks maybe exemplified during what ha happened during the pandemic, but also sort of saying, you know, we're just, going to believe that we can trust yeah. our folks. Yeah. And, and I, that had to be some fascinating conversations. There absolutely were. And they continue to be fascinating conversations because I think you could also argue that trust is multifaceted. And what I mean by that is there's the trust that, you know, if my people are at home, they're doing the work, they'll turn in the things that need to get done. You know, they're not, you know, actively taking on multiple jobs or doing any things that are, you know, nefarious or, or malicious. Um, that's one degree of trust. And I would argue that's kind of the, the base level of trust. There's also a level of trust, which is, do I trust that my teams can figure out how to still collaborate and be creative and be innovative? Um, and so that those are different and they're distinct. And I think that the vast majority of organizations have said, I don't think most of our people are doing anything wrong. You and I were chatting before, there are some companies that have stood up kind of, you know, um, employee surveillance technology, and I could not be more against that if you asked me. There are very few things things that I will get fired up about, that is one of them. 
very few, but but emerging, right? But I think most companies trust that, okay, on the whole, our people are good, they're going to try. I think what we're seeing in some instances is people saying, but I don't trust that we can continue to be creative. I don't trust that we can continue to collaborate. I don't trust that we can have some of the same successes that we've had in the past, unless we go back to doing what we did before. And I think that, and it's not easy, right? We have, you know, thousands of leaders. And so of course, we have a diversity of perspectives. And we genuinely believe that is part of our strength and we embrace it. And yet part of what we've said is, okay, uh, for in order for us to be unapologetic about this, we have actually made decisions at the job level, not at the manager level. And what I mean by that is some organizations have said, Khalil, you decide how often your team needs to come into the office. We looked at that and said, I believe that that's right for bias. I believe that that creates inequity when Susan is a great leader and says her people can work remotely. Khalil is really struggling, so he makes his people come back. But instead of said, well, if this is the job and we believe the job can be done remotely, well, then everyone that's in that job should be able to do that job remotely. And we're going to put the pressure, if you will, on leaders to step up and on employees to kind of build better habits and behaviors. And we're going to give people training and support and resources to be able to do all of that. But I think that other element of trust around, you know, can we be as great as we've been in the past is a place that it's a, I don't know that we always think about it as trust and may just think of it more in terms of, well, the systems are going to break down, the parameters aren't going to work anymore, versus if we know what good looks like, and we've already had that culture to your point of like, yeah, people do great things. We, you know, we have our set of core values that don't live on a wall anywhere, but we, we evaluate people based on them. We reward people based on them. We promote people based on them. They are woven into the fabric of the way that we operate. Well, then we know that urgency and persistence is incredibly important to our organization. And so we know that we can do that, whether we see that because we're over someone's shoulder or because we connect with them on Zoom or WebEx or, you know, Teams or any other platform. Yeah. Let's talk about that workforce strategy and your flex space strategy with the lens of DEI. Mm. Um, how do you think it helps um, diversity, maybe similarly or differently than equity, similarly or differently than belonging? Yeah. So belonging absolutely, I think, gets more challenging in a lot of ways, right? Because in so many instances, and back to kind of, you know, the, the work that I did at Neuro Leadership Institute, when we look at the research, we see that as humans, we want to connect physically with other folks. There is absolutely something different. And I can speak to it from an anecdotal standpoint that when I go out to lunch with somebody, when I go on a walk with somebody, it is slightly different um, or very different in some instances than connecting on video. So the belonging absolutely gets more challenging in a lot of ways. And we're seeing some of that. There's some interesting research that's just showing our, 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 our people are almost bifurcating into some that say, I no longer feel like I need to have friends at work. Like I, I want that separation. I want that space. That's not important to me anymore. I'm creating those, those boundaries. And then some folks that are saying, actually, I really miss having friends at work. I don't feel as connected. I don't feel like I belong in the same ways. I, I don't go out and grab drinks with people or you know, know when their birthdays are or hear about their children um, because we haven't built some of those habits back into place yet. Um, and then similarly, I think in terms of diversity, it absolutely, FlexBase gives us a much broader um, candidate pool. It allows us to meet people where they are. It allows us to go into communities where we don't have a physical space and say, hey, we know that if you're smart and dedicated and you care about technology and you put customers first, you can be successful here. So it kind of doesn't matter where you live now. Um, and so as long as we have a, an entity there, we are you know, securing amazing talent from a lot of different places. And we know that that sometimes physical locations can be an inhibitor to diversity. Because um, if you're in a space where there aren't a lot of a particular demographic, you're either asking those people to pick up and move to a place where there isn't a lot of a particular demographic. So you're saying, you know, when I was consulting, I used to work with folks that would say, hey, we're, we're in the middle of Idaho right? There's not the same level of diversity. So when I'm comparing myself to my partners that are in Atlanta or New York City or Miami, we're at a bit of a disadvantage. Well, now if you can have your headquarters someplace, but recruit talent from anywhere in the country or in the world, you start to level that playing field. And anything that we can do that levels that playing field and raises everyone up at the same time is ultimately beneficial. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I'm laughing about Idaho only because I grew up on the border of Idaho and I can tell you, yeah, that is not an easy place to be diverse. Um, you know, it's just a different environment. And Absolutely. so, and those are just the, that's um, the reality of the situation. Yep. It is. And, and you're not going to change it overnight. I, you know, the whole country is diversifying, but you're not, it's not it's, pockets are going to change at different rates. For sure. Globally, are you seeing any different trends from a global standpoint about Im- the embracing of of flex work um, and and work from home um, that could be related just even to what housing is like in certain countries or what the you know public infrastructure is like in certain countries. Are there any like surprises that have happened as you've been doing this globally? Yeah, you know, there, there's a bunch that comes up. And so, you know, if we kind of filter it through those lenses of things like belonging, uh, you know, there are, uh, I've got folks on my team from, you know, from Poland and from Costa Rica um, that have just said, like, I love going into the office. I love connecting with people. I love, you know, grabbing lunch. And 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 that is a part of our routine. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of the way that we connect with one another. Um, you know, it definitely, there have been some parts of the world where folks have said, and we were chatting a little bit before about the heat wave, right? There was a heat wave that was crossing a lot of the world a while ago. And there are absolutely places in Europe where air conditioning is just not the norm because it doesn't normally get to that level of, of heat. And so if you have the option of working from home and it's you know 35 degrees Celsius or you know 95 degrees That's Fahrenheit, right. or yeah. you can go into an office, you know, or your internet may not be as strong at home, or you may live in a space where you've got multiple people who are you know in a, a relatively small space. And so if you're getting ready to hop on a client call, you say, oh my gosh, I would absolutely prefer to be in the office because it's quiet and the background is curated and I don't have to worry about other people coming in. Um, we also see that in demographics, right? We've seen some people say, I just need to get away from my family. I love them. I just need some space from time to time because the, the break in the day actually allows me to have a work day and then go home and say, we're, we're done here. Um, and so there are all of those different things that are coming in and similarly commutes are another other, you know, great example that to your point around infrastructure, if there is a space where, you know, um, the infrastructure is great and there are buses or trains or I can ride my bike to work, maybe that's wonderful. But yet in a lot of spaces, we haven't clearly, we're not yet through the pandemic. And so those may not be things that folks want to, you know, come together on. So there are, you know, as many different experiences as we have employees. And I would almost multiply that by a factor because, you know, each day is not a single experience for me, right? Every day is a little bit different where I'm saying, well, today I want to go in, but that day I don't. And today the commute would be fine, but this other day I'm dropping off my son at school. And so I want to, you know, not go in because I've got a call right after that. Um, And so we're all still figuring it out together. And one of the things that we've absolutely embraced is a growth mindset. Um, So we adopted that language and that methodology about three years ago um, and have really, you know, embraced that to say, we don't know what we don't know. And so much of this is brand new for so many of us that let's go on this journey together. And we've tried to ask our employees like, hey, how many days do you think you want to go back into the office? office, but just recognize it. We're probably not 100% sure because right now I'm saying I'd love to go back in four days a week. And then when the commute starts back up, we say, oh, never mind. I don't want to do that. Um, and so we're all learning together. And or say to- the orange line closes for an entire time. Exactly. <laughs> yes. For and example, like- for those of you not in Boston, that is something we are all dealing with collectively for anyone who needs to take that train in general. Absolutely. I saw that coming through and people being like, so what do we do now? Right. And yeah. that is this degree of kind of flexibility and variability that is very much just our norm. Um, yeah. And so it's not that we've landed in a place and we need to figure out this new settled state. It is that there's still a bunch of kind of ground moving underneath our feet um, and all of these kind of other layering effects on top of it. And so if we can operate with a degree of, as you were talking about before, trust, which says, I know that my organization is doing this with the best of intentions. I know that our employees are doing this with the best of our intentions um, and we're going to learn together and we're going to move forward together. I think that's some of the most critical elements of the conversation. Absolutely. Um, There's been a term that's trending right now that I know I struggle with, which is quiet quitting. Um, So let's talk about quiet quitting for a second. Did you not see me get amped up enough about uh, (laughs) monitoring software? Now you need to get me on this one. Yes, let's go there. 
So tell people for, who aren't familiar with the term what it implies and what your thoughts are as somebody who is ultimately in charge of engagement and belonging and inclusion, things that um, you know are actual metrics and measurements um, for factors that may be in this term getting challenged. Yeah. So, so, you know, there are a couple different definitions of quiet quitting, but the, the one that I've seen kind of most pervasive is this notion that employees are saying, I'm not going to give um, kind of extra effort. I'm going to do precisely what is asked of me of the job. Um, and, and that's it, right? I'm not going to go above and beyond. I'm not going to volunteer for projects. I'm not going to answer emails on the weekend or on evenings. I'm, I'm not going to do in excess of what my job is. Um, and, and part of why I struggle with that is I do think that there are folks, and we've seen, you know, again, through some articles and some examples of folks that I would argue are doing what you could call the quiet quitting, which is saying, for instance, there was an article about um, some coders uh, that uh, have basically taken multiple jobs because they're like, well, my job only requires 10 to 15 hours a week. I'm going to go work for this competitor as well, and I'll just do two jobs and get two salaries, and I'll put in 10 to 15 hours of each or I make, let's say $100,000 a year to code, I'm going to outsource the work to someone else whom I will pay $20,000 a year and they will do all of the coding and I will basically just take a broker's fee of $80,000 a year. That to me is absolutely gaming the system, manipulating, that's not something that you would largely, I would argue, be proud to say to your employer or to the people around you, that is quiet quitting, right? That is taking a paycheck to not do work. To say that doing 100% of your role and no more is ever synonymous with quitting at this point, I think just reinforces why so many people have struggled with this idea of the rise and grind and the hustle culture. And, and quite honestly, it's not healthy for organizations either, because if everyone in your orbit wants to be promoted, and yet you work in a maturing business where there are not going to be enough promotions for everyone, or there's not going to be enough kind of, you know, gold trophies or blue ribbons for everyone to get, you are just going to have a number of people that are disengaged and disenfranchised and feel like, but I've done everything you've asked. I've done all the extra work. I've put in the extra hours. I've, I've done all of it. And now you're telling me that person's getting promoted and I just need to wait until the next thing comes up. And so I, I think we need to be cautious about the language that we use because when we define role players who are doing a great job in their organization as quiet quitters, I, it, it absolutely, to me, starts to send a message to those employees. It absolutely, um, you know, it kind of changes the way that we view folks. And it, it reinforces, I think, in some ways, some of the monitoring software and things that we were talking about before, because it says, well, I can't trust my people. And therefore, I need to constantly have a beat on what they do. Um, and I, I probably am overly passionate about this in some ways, because for years I have talked about and advocated, um, you know, when I talk about my parents who were asking my background, um, my mother was always the one in my family who was the go-getter. She was always getting promoted. She was always kind of doing more and, and leading people and kind of moving things forward. Um, and my dad was the one that said, I go to work, I put in a hard 40 hours. I want to do enough so that we don't need to talk about me getting promoted. Like I am here to take care of my children and my family. I'm going to be an amazing coworker. I'm going to laugh and joke and get my work done and hit all my metrics, but I don't want to get promoted. I don't want to talk about. And I don't think we celebrate those folks enough. And, and we you know? need them, right? Yeah. Like no, no championship team has ever done what they need to do with only their starters. There are bench players, there are role players, there are, you know, assistant coaches, Coaches and all sorts of other people. That There's the veteran that, that comes back to provide the guidance and leadership. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so celebrating those things and recognizing that there's a tremendous amount of benefit there. And again, that doesn't mean that folks are fixed in a position because your business is always moving forward. So your development is to say, hey, we need to be more nimble than we were before. We need to be, you know, we need to learn new product categories. As we spoke about before, we're now, you know, taking on more traffic than we ever have. So you need your people to move with the pace of the business. But I would argue you have some demographics. You have some people that are holding the business back. You have some people that are moving with the pace of the business and you have some people that are pulling the business forward. But to expect that everyone in your organization is pulling the business forward or else they are designated a quitter 
is just like, asinine to me. I just, I, I genuinely and don't it understand. The data doesn't reinforce it. If you look at the data for at least the pandemic era, the time that we um, eliminated from commuting did not go back into our families, did right. not go to have us go to the gym more, did yep. not have us picking up hobbies. Yep. It went to work generally. Yep. Businesses benefited tremendously. Absolutely. From Productivity that went up. And if anything, you know, it's that I think we're seeing that a lot of people are really burnt and yep. a lot of people are really feeling like I am at kind of the breaking point because there aren't enough boundaries between yep. my, my, you know, how I'm spending time, particularly when I can be always on. In, Absolutely. In a place. How does Akamai support um mental health uh and and emotional health and well-being you know i have a privileged place to know you have an incredible well-being program broadly but i'd love for our um attendees at the show today to hear a little bit more about what you're doing to support both physical and mental and emotional health that yeah absolutely so there there are a, a bunch of layers to that question so uh at the risk of them getting lots of calls from recruiters i'm going to call out carissa burstra and julie paris who helped to oversee um, and lead our wellness programs at akamai um, and they are incredible about exactly what you're describing susan which is looking across the portfolio and understanding what do we need to put in place for financial wellness for mental health Health wellness, for physical well-being and wellness. Um, how do we get those things on the WeSpire platform to make them available to people so folks can participate, they can engage? How do we get them out to folks so that we're constantly communicating them and not just kind of, you know, leaving a, a buffet and saying, well, you can go get it if you want it, it's there for you, but rather bringing things to people's tables and saying, would you like to try this? How about this? We've stood this thing up for you. Getting lots of feedback and, and, and kind of guidance around and what our employees are looking for. And then similarly, at an organizational level, one of the, um, I, would, I would argue, one of the uh, most um, well-received things that we've done over the past five years was to introduce what are referred to as wellness days. Um, and so ironically enough, we have a wellness day coming up on Friday um, in the U.S. and uh, in most other parts of the world. And it happens to be on Sunday and in, in some very specific parts of the world. Um, but essentially what it is, is a, an additional corporate holiday. Um, and so most employees will have that day off. And in part, what that means is we all know, everybody who's listening and watching knows when you take a day off on your own, your work world continues to spin. You're missing phone calls and emails and meetings. You feel like you need to gear up for it. You need like you feel like you need to come back from it. Wellness days are a moment where we all shut down on the whole. Some people will get, get, get a little bit caught up on things, but you know, I was uh, asking a bunch of folks, what are you doing this wellness day? And it was, I'm going to a wedding. I'm going to sleep in. I'm going to play golf with my husband. I'm going to you know, spend some time with my children. Um, and so there are seven of those that are added in strategically placed so that they don't interrupt any other holidays you know, globally. Um, but it's examples like that. And then similarly, you know, so much of it is just education educating our leaders, right? It's educating all of us around how do we build better systems? So to your point around burnout, there was a, um, uh, an article, there's a, a gentleman um, who I've worked with in the past, Professor Jay Van Bavel, um, that writes a lot about just kind of the human condition and all sorts of different things that are going on. He's an um, associate professor uh, out of New York University. Um, but this particular one was around burnout is not an individual issue in most instances. It is a system-wide issue. And so when we treat it with individual interventions, as opposed to looking at the system, when we try to tell people, well, you just need to take a little bit of time off, or you need to practice breathing exercises, or you need to put more, you know, kind of a space in your calendar versus looking at what are the things that the organization is doing as an entity that is exacerbating or contributing to this burnout, then we, we kind of pawn it off, right? It's like looking at, you know, mental health and saying, well, that's the individual, not the system, or looking at any number of things. And so, um, you know, we really have tried to look at what are the resources we can provide? What are the, the, the mechanisms we can put in place like wellness days? What are the actual um, kind of uh, 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 availability of things like mental health professionals so that if people do have a question or they have a need, they can reach out to somebody. Everybody, but it really is the kind of bringing all of those things together that winds up being so valuable. 
Yeah. My last question um, before we'll turn, we've got starting to get some great questions from, from the yes. audience for you is that you really integrated your engagement programs um, under a brand, Akamai Spark, uh, and included well being uh, with DNI, with social impact, and with sustainability. Um, which is which is very forward thinking. There are not a lot of companies that have brought all of those things together. Um, and there's an intersectionality between those that I think you are really seeing and, and benefiting from in the collaboration. Share some of the, the highlights um, with folks who are on this of, of what's happened um, you know, in your culture when you've brought all these things together under a brand, aligned it with your ESG goals um, to, to those various areas. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, the the simplest way to put it is sim is just that we we have more conversations that are about the end employee experience and the things that we are doing to positively impact that or or that are unintentionally getting in the way. Um, and so when you disaggregate those things, you have this group that's trying to get attention over here and this group that's trying to get attention over there. When you bring those things together and we are having kind of uniform conversations around well, what do we want to put out and when do we want to put it out and what does all of this mean? And, um, you know, years and years ago, I worked at an organization that would talk about this idea of gulp rate, which is kind of, you know, how much can, can an individual kind of swallow down before they start to kind of spit some of those things back up? So if we've got wellness over here and inclusion over there, diversity over here, and, you know, our philanthropy over here, sustainability over here, they're all pushing mes messages in a, a largely disorganized way. And the receiver of that is the employee. And we hear it over and over again around, you know, treat our employees like customers. Very few of us actually do it really well. But if we thought about the number of messages that we're going to our customers, if we had marketing sending some things and sales sending some things and, you know, this person sending others, we would look at that and say, that's just untenable. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so for us, it has really been a forcing function. It's challenged us to think about what do we want to get across? What is really valuable? for our employees? What do they feel like they need to know? Um, and how do we bring all of that together in a way that is coherent, not just for our employees, but as we think about the reports that we put out? Because when you talk about ESG, to your point, Susan, like a lot of that is about reporting and governance and um, you know, making sure that we're really checking the boxes by doing the right work, but then also being able to report on that work and help others to understand it and kind of compare and contrast us with other organizations. And so bringing all of that together just makes it that much more uniform and makes the narrative that much more seamless. Yeah, and and um, you know, I know you've seen some big jumps in participation in sending your programs. And I think that's the other thing that we definitely see is that um, folks might naturally be more interested in one of the programs, but then when they join and they see the connections to the other programs, so they join an ERG and then see that that ERG has volunteering opportunities or giving opportunities with certain organizations, they get passionate and more involved in the volunteering and the giving so or you know, that there's um, awesome ways to um, combine well-being and environment, clogging being one of my favorite new trends in that <laughs> intersection between sustainability and wellness. Um, what you mentioned um, that you, you know, getting feedback from employees. One of the questions that we have from the audience was how often do you survey employees and how do does that employee feedback um, end up influencing your DEI and ESG strategies? Yeah, so we have a number of surveys, but the, the most kind of prominent one is referred to as our pulse survey. So we do that quarterly um, and we survey about 50% of our employees. So you kind of get them in an off cycle. So you get two surveys a year, but because we're surveying 5,000 people and get about 30, 40% response, we're getting responses from 15 to 20 20% of our employees at any moment in time, which is a pretty representative sample overall. And we ask a collection of questions and we work with a survey partner called Culture IQ um, and, and then aggregate those together into dimensions. And so that's one of the ways that we've added a quantitative element to things like inclusion and engagement, because we have questions that we're able to benchmark against some of their kind of, you know, top institutions um, that we're able to look at over a period of time to understand 
understand are these individual inclusion related questions trending in any particular direction and then when we bring those together as a dimension where are those moving similarly and then same thing in terms of engagement and sustainability um reliability is a big one for us so we have a bunch of those questions um that we bring together but yeah four times a year are those very formal very kind of large scale surveys um that you know take five to ten minutes for folks to fill out so it's not a an overly cumbersome task um but then the question around so what do we do with that immediately after the survey closes i get those results and kind of looking at them along the way and there's a wonderful woman on my team that oversees the survey administration and kind of pulling together those results then those immediately go to anthony our chief hr officer my boss who then talks about them with tom our ceo then those go out to all of our hr business partners who get individual cuts of that data and have conversations with their business partners we also put all of the data on our internal um, intranet um, so that our employees can see where are we where are we trending what are some of the top themes and or concerns and so there are kind of interventions taken at the local level so someone may see oh wow we don't feel like our um, benefit score is as high as we'd like it to be so is there an opportunity to communicate more effectively or to give some feedback um, but similarly at the organizational level we'll partner back up with the constituent teams and say here's where some data is trending what can we do about that right i find um pretty universally when we work with companies um there is is feedback that is because people don't know something exists versus there being something that doesn't exist you know Absolutely. and so i think one of those challenges back to reaching employees and communication um coming out of a marketing realm is you always thought about reach and frequency and yeah. somehow i think for a while, internal comms professionals forgot about the frequency part of this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's like, okay, you got one mention in the newsletter. We're good, you know. Yep. Um, and it's like we do not get in front of folks um five times, seven times, different you know, mechanisms. There they'll it will not break through. That's just Absolutely. how we are as humans. We're sort of tuned to until we hear it multiple times. Um yeah. so there's a lot of questions about remote work. And I mm. think what you all are doing. Um, maybe the envy of many, many, many folks, either because um, it's what they're hoping their organization does or because it seems like you have put a lot more time and energy and thinking into this. But um, first and foremost, there's a question about how operationally did you decide what made financial sense when mm. employee opinions are shifting and they may be one day in person, they may be three days in person, they may shift back and forth. How, how do you plan for that in terms of an office space and finance standpoint, or to just say, we're going to make this investment, this is what the investment's going to be, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, so uh, I, similarly, I'm calling out all these wonderful people. I hope they don't start getting a bunch of you know emails and, and calls. There's uh, one of the best partners I've ever worked with, a gentleman who oversees our real estate uh, pro footprint um, globally, John Civello. Um, uh, his just I mean, he's a rock star when it comes to this. I, I, I wish every organization could hear him talk about the way that he's thought about this. And so some of it absolutely is evaluating and kind of understanding from employee sentiment. How often do folks think they'll go back? What do they anticipate their behaviors will look like? We've also been conservative in terms of not letting go of more space as we continue to grow and as we think about more people coming back. Um, so there are some spaces where, you know, we've said, okay, we could sublease this particular tranche of floors and you know we could take some finances back in take some money back in you know not lose anything you know per se but keep these spaces for all of our employees that will be coming in so we've really tried to find that balance of how do we create a healthy and thriving office experience so that we are not inherently pushing people to work from home but also making sure that we have equipment set up uh, you know making sure that um you know we have are starting to get food service back into our local offices um and so a lot of it was based on modeling, right? It's looking and yeah. saying, well, you know, we had this footprint before. Our people are telling us that we think we need this. If we let go of some of this, what do we get back? You know, how long are some of our, our um, you know, contracts currently? When do we feel like we can renegotiate some of these things? Um, and so we've been very deliberate not to swing the pendulum and say, oh, people said they're going to work from home. Great, shut it all down. But rather yeah. to say, okay, this is what we think we're going to do, but let's see. So let's shut like down some of these real floors. estate. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I 
think it's a great, great phrase for it, right? Let's let's not put people on some of these floors so that we do kind of compress some folks together so that we can have a thriving environment and you don't have 20 people spread across 20 floors. Um, but also then we don't need to clean some of those floors or have electricity in some of those floors. So guess what? We're being more responsible to the environment as well. So it really yeah. is looking at the totality of these pieces and thinking about what would our what would our employees tell us? What do we think is realistically going to happen? And then marrying that with some of the financial modeling and the real estate modeling. Right. And 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 being agile about it and recognizing Absolutely. that we're all kind of making this up as we go. And yep. so giving ourselves the ability to make mistakes and roll back, um, yep. something we're very familiar with in, in the tech world, um, you know, but we, that we've got to do in the physical world uh, as well. Um, how do you work with leaders um, to ensure that values um, are, you know, being embedded into a more remote flex workforce, um, you know, helping people build those connections uh, with leaders? We, yeah, you know, we have a, a fascinating generation of, of leaders in place right now you know, um, often age-wise, many of whom, you know, started their careers before the internet even existed, <laughs> you know? um, and who now are being asked to figure out how to lead in a remote workforce, often with little or no preparation, training, or coaching. Um, and it can be a recipe for disaster, as, yeah. as we've discussed. Um, so what are you guys doing to deliberately work with your leaders to help them adapt to this totally different world? Yeah, so there are a couple of things. So, um, you know, one, as I spoke about kind of the, the relationship that I initially had with Akamai as I came on from Neuro Leadership Institute, part of what the, the connection there was is training that we put out education around things like how to mitigate bias, how to operate with a growth mindset, how to be inclusive in the social domains of inclusion and exclusion, how to create an environment where people feel comfortable speaking up. And just recently we've rolled out another where we're kind of synthesizing all of that together to say, how do we take everything that we've learned over the past two years and really apply that in a new remote and hybrid workforce? And so it really oh, is carrying right. those things all the, the way through. That's the Neuro Leadership Institute program? It is, yeah. So it's a, a, a each of those are kind of individual, but you can, you know, kind of um, uh, batch them Thank together you. almost, if you will. Um, and then similarly, our global talent development team rolled out some training around how to work in a hybrid environment and how to lead in a hybrid environment. Um, and so we've Try to be really deliberate um, about the, the notion that these concepts can not only be incumbent on leaders. Um, in so many ways, I think that, you know, leadership has become kind of that classic Abraham Maslow quote, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so it's like, well, you know, let's just give training to the managers and they'll get it. Let's tell the managers about that and they'll disseminate it. Let's give it to the managers and they'll kind of push this thing out. We also, like, I need to think differently about how do I engage with my boss? How do I engage with my direct reports? How do I engage with my peers, because this is new for all of us. And so if I'm only looking for Anthony to say, okay, Khalil, here's how I'm going to make your experience better as a remote employee, then I'm, I'm abdicating my own responsibility versus us allowing employees and really pushing employees to say, how are you building relationships? How are you helping your manager lead you? And managers, how are you helping your employee? And so if we've got individual contributors that are going 80% of the way and, and leaders that are going 80% of the way, there's a lot of overlap there. But if we're just saying leaders need to go 100% of the way, or each will go 50% of the way and meet in the middle, it leaves a lot of opportunity for gaps to exist. Um, and yeah. so absolutely, all of this education before, we also have LinkedIn learning. There's a lot of great content on there. Um, we also, and, and again, this very particular kind of leading and thriving in a hybrid at workplace um, is specific training around. So what do we do with all of this now? And we'll continue to have these conversations and learn from things like Pulse and a bunch of our other surveys. Right. And, and how either in this training or in addition to this training, are you thinking about filling that water cooler void? You mm -hmm. know, that um, those, uh, you know, conscious collisions, I think, um, you know, Google called them at one point in time, or just that, that stuff we all at some point learn just by being around each other. Um, yeah. And those connections we built just by physically being present. What are you doing, thinking about adding, 
worried about um, as it relates to those, um, you know, a, a, again, those, those water cooler connections or those formerly physically dependent connections. Yeah, you know, to your point, you know, yes, kind of what are we doing? What am I worried about? What I'm worried about is how to roll that out organizationally so that everyone has an opportunity to benefit from it. Because I think when we go back to kind of what we were doing before, those water cooler conversations weren't always equitable not everyone felt like they could get into that water cooler conversation. Not everybody had something or felt like they had something to add to it or that water cooler conversation was around, you know, how did X sports team do over the weekend? Or did you just watch this television show? And, you know, not everybody felt like they could participate. Um, and, and so part of it is as we build it, how do we build an even better one? But we haven't built it yet. We absolutely haven't. You know, we've done some incredible things across our employee resource groups. So like one that our women forum did was referred to as coffee roulette, um, where basically you kind of signed up and put your name in, you know, a, a, a proverbial hat, almost, if you will. Um, and then they connected people. So everyone got connected to somebody else and just set up 30 minutes to meet somebody that you had never met before and never had an interaction with before. Um, we're seeing that a lot at the local level, local teams or smaller teams that are setting that up. But it's absolutely something we're going to need to solve for at the macro level across the organization as a whole. So if anybody has great ideas, let me know. No. So I think you're back now, Susan. I think I lost you for a second. No, either I lost Susan or Susan lost me. Looks like she may have frozen up. Let me just message her. We'll see. See, I never freeze looking that good. Like I've always like my mouth is wide <laughs> open, like my I've got one eye closed. So uh, only we could all be this lucky, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I need to get some suggestions there. I'm taking a quick look to see. Um oh, there she is. Hi, Susan. Hello. I <laughs> I just blipped. That's the classic internet. <laughs> Indeed. World. I clearly need more Akamai in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the um, the last question that I was going to ask uh, that I actually was finding really fascinating as a concept, and then somebody asked the same question, which is around systemic wellness. And mm. how did you initiate that concept and conversation in the workforce and mm. move that conversation from being a uh, conversation about individual mental health and well being to team culture and system well being? How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, largely it is because we are. Um, we're, we're fortunate in a lot of ways to be led by a lot of folks who have spent a lot of time in academia. Uh, and so again, you know, Dr. Layton was a professor at MIT. We've got a number of other folks. So, and when we think about the work that we do, we are thinking about the system, right? We're thinking about the mechanisms that we put in place. And so when we have our user experience team looking at some of the tools that we've build, we are looking at individual behavior, but we're trying to figure out how do we tweak the system in order to be able to optimize the experience for our users. And so it's woven through everything that we do that, you know, if you build a kind of weak product, no matter how educated the person is, they're going to get frustrated, they're not going to want to use it, they're not going to use it in the way that you intended. And yet, if you tweak the system, if you tweak where you put the, you know, the button or the, you know, the, the toggle switch or some of those things, that inevitably changes the way that people interact with it. And so I think there's just a natural recognition that we are a part of a larger ecosystem ecosystem. And that translates into the way that we think about the business as well. And so, you know, when we think about, well, this person is struggling, and that one is struggling, and that one is struggling, it, we're able to zoom out and say, well, that's less about the individuals and potentially more about what are we doing? How are we optimizing? How are we setting folks up? And so, you know, there's a bunch of kind of um, great articles and great research. And, um, you know, I, again, I spent three years here, so I talk about it all the time, but Neural Leadership Institute has a really useful model, I think, um, that is about this idea of priorities, 
habits and systems. And so if you want to change behaviors, you need to make sure that you're hitting all three of those and priorities are all about the, you know, marketing and the branding and, you know, are people aware of it? The habits are like, what do you want to see or hear people doing differently? What does it look like? What does it actually sound like? And the, the systems are, how do you reinforce those things? How do you bake them into your organization? Because habits that require unique energy every single time where I need to decide to do this thing all the time are probably not going to sustain. But when you build that into how you promote people, how you reward people, how you recognize people, then it just becomes a natural, more natural part of the way that you operate. And and when it just gets baked into, as we call it, that that you put those habits stacked so that one habit of doing something leads to the other habit of doing something, which leads to the to the others. Absolutely. Um, so I think we we talked about this uh, in the in the in the pre prep time, but I think one thing we both agree is that this area of work, uh, which is this combination of ESG, uh, equity and inclusion. Um, and engagement might be one of the greatest business opportunities remaining. Um, that we would never let a hotel be 70% occupied or websites be down 70% of the time or customers um, 70% of the time to not really like our product. And and yet companies have, have, I think, struggled to acknowledge they can do something about that 70%. Um, What would be your, if you were standing up in front of, you know, the Fortune 500 CEOs talking about this work and what's the most important thing that they should be doing and their teams should be doing around workforce, culture, experience, and engagement, what advice would you give them? I mean, you know, I... Hopefully I would have put more thought into it than this, but I I think so much of it is like show up and talk about it and demonstrate these behaviors. Because what I continue to hear from folks is, well, yeah, that group is talking about it, but I don't see my leaders doing it. Or they talk about it every now and then, but it's not actually coming up as a part of our conversations. Or, you know, we're, we're so focused on these other things that we talk about employee engagement, you know, once a quarter when the, the survey comes out. And if it's not a part, like it, it, it is, similar to, you know, like how you parent or, or any of these other things that like what you demonstrate is what your people know that you care about over and over and over again. And so if we're checking in on these experiences, if we're checking in on how this fits together, if we're having these conversations, if we're questioning, if we are saying, I realize that that person is hitting their sales goals, but how are they getting there? I realize that this is, you know, that the business seems healthy right now, but how are we building that resilience long-term? Those are the conversations that really push this thing forward and you know we were we were chatting before this is a little bit about this notion of like you can't go back to what existed before and as you say some of our leaders have been around for quite some time and they're used to a bit more of command and control there, there is no I use the term like you can't hop in the DeLorean and go back and like you know even if you thought those were the good old days it's fundamentally changed and employees have shown us what they value what we value um, and we need to listen and we need to be deliberate about how we follow that and really lead it because um, it is the, the 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 organizations that get this right will be able to write their own future. And on that note, we are going to end because that is inspiring for everyone on today's show. So Khalil, thank you so much for coming. I always learn so much from you. The work you're doing is amazing. The work Akamai is doing is amazing. And we're really, really thrilled to be able to be a part of it. So we love um, having you as a partner. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody, uh, we hope we see you back here uh, next month for We Spire Live. It, uh, it's been fun and, and we're looking forward to um, our next guest, who is going to be Andrew Winston um, from Eco Strategies, one of the smartest people in the sustainability world. And uh, given the um, the Inflation Reduction Act, the worst named act for the best news ever, um, he's going to be here to to start talking about all the things that we as companies should be doing to encourage, motivate, and inspire and take advantage of this incredible legislation. So we'll see you all next month. Take care. Bye.